Wales, the end of the afternoon, uh, to come and uh, uh, engage with this, uh, with this theme. I hope that's going to work and you can hear me a little more um, clearly. So it is a, it's a pleasure and a privilege to be here at this uh, wonderful University of Duke again this week. My thanks to my good friend, uh, Professor Peter Fever, for conceiving of the visit to Edward Dixon, Emily Harrell, Catherine, and Paige Rotunda for making the practical arrangements and for filling out my time uh, here uh, with all sorts of interesting talks, at least interesting for me. I'm not sure if anybody else found them in the least bit interesting. Now, um, this title for this lecture, indeed for, uh, for all of my time at Duke this week, is Confucius Christ and Contemporary Geopolitics. The theme reflects my fascination with China over, over many years. And as you've heard already, my more recent interest in the relationship between faith and the ethos of Western Christendom and the philosophy, culture, and ethics of historically Confucian China. Study of this interface led to the publication last year of my book, uh, which some of you may have glanced at, Christianity, Confucianism, Culture, Faith, and Politics, published by Bloomsbury, which stirred amazingly Professor Fever to ask me to come and to talk to you all a little bit about it and about engaging China uh, more generally today. Now, frankly, though most of our minds are still focused on Ukraine and the threat Russia poses to the Western Alliance, I hope this time together spent pondering China, with whom, of course, uh, President Putin has warm relations as he does to any and every nation and pariah state that's not antithetical to his imperial agenda, that this will cast light uh, on the current crisis afflicting uh, Eastern Europe. Now, as I give, give this talk, I, I'm aware of how much my attitude to, towards China has evolved over the years, particularly over the last 20 some years. Between 2000 or so, when I began teaching extensively in China's leading universities, and about 2010, when the reversionary change in China began to be more noticeable, in those 10 year years, I often spoke, sometimes passionately here in the US, about what I would call letting China change. Knowing, as I was a regular visitor to China at the time, that there was a wide, wide gulf between what I knew at the highest level to be China's honest quest to engage positively with the West. And what I saw based in the West was the West's persistent rebuttals and willful denigration of Chinese values. That was how I saw things for that sort of 10 year period. I have to confess, all that has changed under President Xi Jinping. My lectures now are more often on the rise of China and the fearsome threat that poses to the rest of the world. But, 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 and this is the heart of my book and my lecture this evening. Is there any other way to understand what are falsely called, I'll explain why in a moment, East-West relations than in these adversarial terms. Well, I believe there is, and I believe the Jolly World should be. Now, just to reassure you, to make what I say, I hope a little more bearable, I'm going to divide my lecture, my talk into two parts with a time for questions and answer after each part. First part, if I may, I want to talk a little bit about my book and what writing it has taught me. That's the longer part. And then in the second part, the last third, I want to briefly reflect with you all on the significance of the relationship between Christianity and Confucianism for contemporary geopolitics. In case you want to keep an eye on the clock, as I said, the first part is much longer than the second. So to part one, Christianity and Confucianism 
culture, faith, and politics, my book. I want to read, if I may, a section of the preface uh, of the book in a moment. And this will help, hopefully uh, give you some idea of the sort of direction that I take in the book. But first a word on uh, why I came uh, to write it. My interest in China and in Christianity in China goes back to my childhood in North London, central North London. It's also traced to my undergraduate days in Oxford in the 70s, and then to my doctoral studies in another Durham up in the northeast of England. In England, at Islington rather, in central London as a boy, I was surrounded by ex-China missionaries. As I said to some of you this morning, my vicar, my pastor on whom I grew up, was part of the transatlantic Adeny family that served in China for decades. But then as a history undergraduate in Oxford, I joined groups of so-called China watchers to study and we prayed for Christians in China, imagining that they would never be accorded the freedoms they'd enjoyed prior to 1949. As you know, the uh, president of the World Council of Churches in 1949 was Chinese. As an extension of that interest, after another theology degree and ordination training in Durham, I was awarded a government scholarship to study what some call the Little Flock Church in mainland China, an indigenous Chinese expression of Protestantism. In the end, I rerouted my doctorate for thematic reasons, but never lost my fascination with this vast and wonderful country. So when I found myself invited to teach Christian theology and cross-cultural studies in the philosophy department at Peking University and in a host of other universities and departments across China in the early 2000s, my original interest had a chance to be rekindled. Having been a visiting professor at a major Indian theological institution since the mid 90s, it looked all of this much more interesting and useful to me and my wife than remaining a cathedral dean. And so we did what deans not really supposed to do, we exercised faith. And uh, we uh, left that job and moved to doing the work I now do. Hence, by a circuitous route, as you've heard, to do the work I now do, operating between the academy and high-level diplomacy to ensure culture, ethics, and religion are fully integrated, fully integrated into contemporary geopolitical analysis and practice. A few days ago, we had a major away from the, the uh, camera meeting on Myanmar, bringing together all the key parties from inside and outside the country. And we thought to facilitate that, providing or holding the ring in a responsible, even-handed way. And that's part of the work that Oxford House does. <clears throat> um, now I say all that, forgive me. I, I say all that simply because I hope to show in this introduction that all those themes sort of converge uh, in the book. When friends have asked me what, uh, what <laughs> the book's publication felt like, I've often replied, it's never happened to me, like giving birth to an elephant. No book uh, should be a word or a page longer than necessary. Let's be clear. The fact that Christianity and Confucianism is just under 700 pages is because it could not, to my mind, have been any shorter. And thankfully, Bloomsbury, the publishers, agreed. And my wonderful but at times rather direct father-in-law was a publisher of theology books. His advice to me as a young academic was clear. First of all, he said, many people regret books they publish too soon. Don't. And I'm glad I didn't attempt to write this book uh, any younger. Because of course, books should, should express a life and not just a mind. So to the book and a section of the preface. It's quite a long quotation. I'll tell you therefore when it ends. I read. This is a story more than a study. It tells the story of a long and difficult conversation. At times, the two parties had ignored one another. Rather more often, too often, they cussed, accused, 
and fought. Both are to blame for the state of their disunion. Like warring siblings or a divorcing couple, they profess innocence and indict the other. The book is the story of this stormy relationship. It also tells the story of where it all began in the hope that memory will heal. Time will tell. The story begins by introducing the two main characters, the founding fathers of great dynasties. It proceeds to relate six instances in history when their successors met, conversed, and clashed. Some of this story is well known, much is little known, with disastrous effects. Like casualties of inherited abuse or multiple forms of dependency, inheritors of this fraught history are innocent victims of others' culpability. It's only if or when we join up the dots of history, we understand the complexity of this legacy. History, like memory, can also heal. Denial is a great enemy of therapy. It takes many forms. Behind I'm not to blame lies the lie, I'm never to blame and see things as they truly are. There's a denial of guilt and a denial of intention or failure to grasp motivation. International relations is now alert to this deep affective dimension. We study the mind of the suicide bomber. We examine denial of wrongdoing. We try to explain the abuse of power or corruption of position. Our story is full of denial and the acute complexities that brings. History relates and perpetuates dishonesty. No amount of therapy can help the fundamentally deceitful and self-deceived. I'm speaking, of course, of the long, tortuous history of Sino-Western relations. I'm also talking of the source and legacy of the moral and intellectual frameworks, those mighty cultural dynasties which formed China and Christendom, uh, Confucianism and Christianity. In chapters one and two, we return to the founding fathers of these two great dynasties, Jesus and Confucius. Chapters three to eight visit select instances, historical snapshots, if you like, when the dialogue between China and the West and thence Christianity and Confucianism intensified. My argument is, that both China and the West have been indelibly affected by this exchange. Indeed, affected to a degree that we do not, perhaps cannot, maybe even will not appreciate. Coming to terms with history and memory can be intensely painful. Denial, evasion, anger, blame, distortion, threat and corruption are tempting. Therapists expect this. Truth must be made attractive. I hope it is here with the attraction of fascination, discovery, veracity, perhaps even the offer of truth and the scent of peace, rather than well-worn deception or denial of the possibility of change and reconciliation. The thematic chapters in part two and three will hold gems of historical wisdom for some, costly choices for others. End quote. I think I want to say how, how little China featured in my history degree in Oxford in the early 1970s. Since then, of course, global historians and historians of ideas in the West have been playing catch up on China's impact on Western culture, while Chinese academics have conversely been filling in the blanks on China's engagement with and debt to the West, including, as I will indicate later, to Christianity and Christian mission. My book is an exposition then of the interpenetration of mutual formation of Western Christendom and Confucian China. I did not, I confess, set out to write such a book. 
I am, after all, not a professional sinologist. The project Bloomsbury and I began was a, a more limited philosophical and theological comparison of biblical Christianity and classical Confucianism, a theme that I'd published on already. But when President Xi Jinping began to say a few years ago, I quote, China does not embrace Western values, I found myself challenged to re-examine and in time refute that claim. So my book seeks to show in more ways than I for one knew how China has shaped the West and the West shaped China. If today China does not embrace Western values, then it's not because China does not know those values. Rather, it chooses to forget or deny them. And in the process, and this is crucial, it is forgetting or denying its own rich, ancient cultural heritage and identity. Likewise, though, if or when the West projects otherness onto China, it's doing something China does not deserve and may take exception to. And let's be clear, the categories East and West with an association, an associated implication of clear cultural or physical boundaries between them is palpably army. The new sciences of anthropology and culture studies militate against this artificial subdivision of human history and are necessarily and essentially hybrid cultural identity or identities, trade and travel, military campaigns and missionary journeys, snatches of music and slips of paper, silk, cloth, tea, porcelain, portraiture, poetry, and news have over time created the background tapestry of our one beautiful interconnected world. And my book is a humble contribution to recovery and celebration of that essential, and I believe at this time, especially important truth, one world. When colleagues have asked me about the book, I've often found myself saying, I've tried to write every page, so people will say, I didn't know that, or perhaps a little more humbly, I have no idea how I ever presumed to give a lecture before. I've learned so much in the process of writing it all with a twinkle in my eye. I'm having such fun making connections I never knew existed, joining up history and historical events, culture and cultural variations, Christian ideas and Chinese political ideologies. All of this has been a deeply enriching and satisfying experience. And of course, it isn't a journey I could possibly have made alone. My dear Chinese friends, academic colleagues have been central to the venture. My hope in time that they will write an oriental counterpart to my necessarily occidental offering. I was delighted to hear one of my very senior friends in Beijing now received the book, which he read in draft. He's busy, busy reading and quoting it. Hope you might consider taking time to make the journey that I made. Like an early travelogue to Africa, Asia, or the Americas, the book tells the story of a journey of discovery. And like those early explorers, I went where I hadn't been before and hope in time that you might consider following in my footsteps. Alas, the hardback is far too expensive for any of you to contemplate buying without a mortgage. Uh, uh, but it's coming out in paperback in August and hopefully that will be put it slightly more in range for all of us. Now, for the rest of the introduction, I just want to share, if I may, four learnings for me from the book. They're personal, may not be what you would take away, but I hope they provide a sense of what the book is saying and perhaps should say even more loudly that, than it does to our beautiful but battered planet. So, four learnings. One, like Dr. Zeus, thing one. First, and I've touched on this already, what I would call the multifaceted mechanism of cultural exchange. A multifaceted mechanism of cultural exchange. 
Let me unpack that a bit. Over the last 20 years or so, I've attended numerous academic conferences in China. When I began teaching comparative philosophy and theology at Peking University in the early 2000s, I had no idea there were probably 40 other leading Chinese universities that had some kind of Christian studies program in them, embedded in a host of different departments, all over full with bright students and very committed academics. And over the years, it's been my privilege to teach in many of them. Three events, though, stand out from that phase of my life that helped to germinate ideas in my book. The first, first event was, was a conference on historical geography at Fudan University, Shanghai. Most attendees were from mainland China or Japan. Paper after paper at the conference tracked the cultural ties between medieval China and Japan. I had no idea until then how much maps and artifacts, traders and trade brought and taught in unthinking acts of cross-cultural encounter. And my book tracks that process using what I call cultural archetypes, accessible to specialists and general readers, as if you like thematic light motifs that unite and explicate each chapter's theme. So porcelain production and the tea trade, sculpture and story, poetry, pain, suffering and death, are used in the book to illustrate the multifaceted mechanism of cross-cultural exchange that bound and bind Christendom and Confucian China. For the second event uh, from this period of interacting with Chinese scholars was my first visit to the philosophy department at Wuhan University, to many as prestigious as its counterpart in Peking University. First visit, for two hours, I found myself quizzed by a room full of Chinese faculty. On what? On the finer points of Thomist theology and philosophy. That's the philosophy of Thomas Aquinas. Why? They had just completed a multi-volume translation of the works of Thomas Aquinas finding in his thought resonances with Confucian and Taoist ideas, as had, of course, those early 17th century Jesuit scholar missionaries and Chinese Illuminati in Ming Dynasty Emperor Wanli's Forbidden City. Third event was a mobile conference on comparative literature that flew me from Renmin University in Beijing overnight to Xining high on the Tibetan plateau to deliver a paper on the religious experience of the poet Lord Byron, a distant relative. Oh dear, oh dear, dear, dear. Academics make mistakes. I knew just about enough to give the paper. My Chinese listeners knew much more. Don Juan, Child Harold, had all been translated decades before, were well known, dearly beloved, why the poet admired as a mighty religious iconoclast and a model of romantic freedom. Literature and translation play a big part in my book. So T.S. and George Eliot, Dickens and Lynn Joshu, Husserl, Proust, Ezra Pound, and many, many others, all part of my own epic narrative of cross-cultural exchange. You see, friends, what I glimpsed in those three academic events became the vast terrain that I explored uh, in this book. Second takeaway, much more briefly, the compatibility of Confucian and Christian ethical teaching. I don't want to spend much time on this. Others have been down this path before, not least those Jesuit missionaries I mentioned earlier. At the end of each chapter in the book, I look in detail at the text of the New Testament Gospels and at the Confucian Analects or sayings of Confucius to see what they say about the chapter's primary theme, be it God or heaven, tian, or humanity or truth, about memory or right about suffering and death. Early in the book, I say some readers may find the 
the end of the chapter is a useful place to begin. So I end chapter five, for example, on character, purpose, and morality, looking at the enculturated practical moral philosophy, which is classical Confucianism, and also at Jesus's ethical vision and instruction in the Gospels. As I pondered this material, I was struck again by the similarity between the golden rule of love to which both Jesus and Confucius appeal in their different ways. And impressed too by the durability of what they say. In the introduction to the book, I quote Carl Jasper's account of these two great figures as paradigmatic figures, he called them, who when we go through the careful process of picture restoration, the metaphor I use in the book, these figures inspire and provoke in equal measure. We may not agree with their every conclusion, no, but in different ways, they challenge us to look at how we live and love, how we serve ourselves in hand, teach and respect, effect change and order society. You know, it's not surprising that for 30 years after the Cultural Revolution, China's leaders and intellectual elite engaged in a sustained exercise to understand the success of Christendom. The reason there were so many study, Christian studies programs was because China wanted to fill its post Maoist ethical vacuum and found in classical Christianity a compelling, culturally compatible answer. But, 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 there is one significant difference between biblical Christianity and classical Confucianism. The Analects, saying of Confucius and other Chinese classics as they're called, have nothing like Jesus's teaching on what we call agape love, that God-given unconditional love for any neighbor. Confucianism is a sensitively constructed system of moral and ritual obligation. Christianity commends lavish gifts of unconditional love. And it was this practical inclusive love Christian mission brought and taught to China. As one of my very, very senior Chinese scholar friends said to me on the impact of Christian mission on China, he said, Chris, we wouldn't be the country we are without Christianity. Not something I hasten to add you hear every day from Western secular sinologists. So to my third learning, very briefly, was the extent of China's role in shaping the mind and culture of the West. As indicated in the preface, after introducing Confucius and Jesus in chapter one and two, chapters three to eight unpack their theme against a progressive historical narrative. Hence chapter five, as I said, on ethics is written in light of the impact of Chinese thought on the 18th century European enlightenment. Now, of course, that connection is now widely recognized, as is the West's passion for chinoiserie in the late 18th and early 19th century. Less well known is the comprehensive impact of Sinophilia, love for China, on 17th century Britain, and its reversal after the failed McCartney and Amherst embassies to the Qing court prior to the First Opium War. Likewise, the role 19th century Protestant missionaries played as remarkable countercultural cultural intermediaries when East West relations were, as today, fraught. And the stimulus that work gave to a second round of Sinophilia in early 20th century modernism in the West. So it is from US presidents to Impressionism, from Lin Xu to Charles Dickens from Xifu Theatre to Wagner, from Jane Austen to Adam Smith and Karl Marx, the book tells a story of mutual formation. If not 
always mutual respect between China and the West. You may say, why is this story not better known? Because I fear it has been and is diplomatically and culturally inconvenient. My last takeaway, number four, is this thing four. Is what the book has taught me, and then time for question and answer. A question, yeah. Um, the last takeaway is what the book has taught me about the commonality, I might call it, lived experience. In other words, it's technically, I mean more to some of you than to others, it's technically a long exercise in historical, existential, uh, historical existential hermeneutics. Or well, put another way, a cross-cultural study in how we see and read the world. Hermeneutics, as you may know, is the, the name given to the science of reading and interpreting texts that first emerged in the early 19th century. The term is now extended to encompass the multiple stimuli that shape our views of just about everything from life and death to religion, culture, values, and indeed truth itself. Now, as a historian, a theologian, a philosopher, student of culture, I'm acutely aware of the, aware of the way this now vast science of understanding lays hegemonic claims on most academic disciplines, and it can't be easily ignored. My book tells the story of the growth of the discipline through to chapter eight, on entitled Sickness, Death, and the Afterlife. A theme which I present amid mid 20th century existential philosophy and modern or now postmodern hermeneutics. This is more than a professional obligation or private passion. The evidence demands it. If Confucius was, as some say, the father of the Enlightenment, and Immanuel Kant, the guiding star of 20th century China, the existentialism of French philosophers Albert Camus and Jean-Paul Sartre, and the enlarged hermeneutic vision of writers like hans georg Gadamer, Paul Ricoeur, Jürgen Habermas, have exerted all of them an, an immense influence on late 20th century Chinese philosophy, politics, and culture. More than this, and this is my final point, more than this, study of this material and its impact on modern China has confirmed for me how our existential issues of life and pain and suffering and death and the afterlife, as modern hermeneutics consistently reminds us, they are heard, read through the same lens in China and the rest of the world, the same lens of our shared human lived experience. So at a time when China and the world are again at odds with one another, my book is an ironic attempt to remind us how much we have in common by simply being human. The genius, and I use that word advisedly, of classical Confucianism and historic Christianity is that both traditions invite wise reflection on ultimate reality and chasten us for the pettiness that thoughtlessly divides. So what next? Well, perhaps a companion volume on Christianity and communism, Marxism, or a parallel study of Christendom and in India or Persia, or there too, East and West, if we should ever, ever really use those terms anymore, have profoundly shaped one another. I hope that's enough to begin to probe some questions. Uh, and then we'll pause and stand up, do your exercises and uh, all sorts of things. But I hope that you might have some questions for me to help you appropriate some of that material and come back at me. A free for all, please. For, yes. Uh, for both the West and for China to acknowledge our mutual formation. Yes. I was hoping you could elaborate a little bit more on what you mean by that and why you think that is the case. I think we love to have an enemy. Uh, people who want to uh, raise m money for military strategy need to have a reason to do that. It's as true of the Western Alliance 
uh, as in some ways it is for China, it's good to have an opponent. Um, and uh, we know that even when there's peace, people are looking for reasons uh, to distance themselves from other cultures and communities. I think also there is a chronic Western self-satisfaction in our own identity. And we think everybody else has been less, if you like, by us. It's, I think, very good. And I, though I sound very English. I think I'm thoroughly internationalized to discover what extraordinary the riches there are in other cultures around the world. And, uh, but admitting that fact can be very uncomfortable if you want to control the narrative, want to control the story. And part of the otherizing, dare I say the demonizing of China, as we did in the previous phase of uh, Soviet hostility, uh, that, that process uh, does get us into a pickle and it's, it's tragic. The evidence I don't think is as justifiable as is sometimes claimed. And that's be sure the inconvenience is something most of us try to, to uh, avoid personally, culturally, religiously. And we do it in the political, geopolitical sphere as well. Thank you so much, sir. This has been so fascinating. Um, I was wondering, when I first heard of this issue, like many of us, I'd imagine it was when former President Trump and his administration spoke at length of the Christian repression in China. Um, would you speak to how his rhetoric shaped East-West relations in our contemporary and how it may have helped or further alienated these Christian populations in the region? Um, yes, I'm delighted to address that. It's a, there's a complicated story about you know, like US commentary on, on Chinese Christianity. Um, 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 remarkable religious freedom was accorded the Chinese populace from the end of the Cultural Revolution, really through to about 2010, 2008, 2010. Much more freedom than most Western commentary wanted to admit. And many is the time I would sit with State Department people having just come back from China and witness the freedom and would be told that China just imprisons Christians. And I thought to myself, you don't know that I lecture in these university departments with the brightest and best on Christian subjects. No, 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 that doesn't happen. It did happen, it simply did, and it was huge. Um, but the drum of the persecution, persecution, persecution was not uh, stopped in some Western circles. Uh, we rather like to know Christians are being persecuted. For some agencies, it's a good way to raise money to fund uh, their, their work, their ministers. Um, and alas, some of the recovery of that persecution narrative um, was helped to instrumentalize, I think, some of China's hardening of its resolve. It felt that Western mission was actually trying to undermine the Chinese government in a very deliberate way. They tracked some of the operatives back to source. And uh, we had these extraordinary moments of, of, of clash of cultures where um, uh, either side was really hearing the other and willfully not hearing, hearing the other. So over, since 20, 2008, 2010, perhaps 2012, when new laws came in, a new program of synthesization came into China, there has been a, a severe reversion into what they call the second cultural revolution. Screws have been tightened on any expression of dissent. And that makes it extremely difficult. Christians are now legitimately represented as victims of that oppression. They're not the only category at all, but they also suffer in the process. And when I'm asked to give high level opinions for legal cases in the, in the British judiciary, uh, I have to be candid and say the situation has gone 180 degrees from what it was. My opinions have had to change. It's now extremely difficult. It was not always like this, even though some wanted to say it was, and indeed, even though some Chinese Christians wanted to continue to say it was like that. It, it wasn't always. And my very senior Chinese friends 
would want to say, we have freedoms. Not anymore in the same way. And it's tragic. Thank I hope you. that's enough. Yes, please. Sure, thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate um, hearing your lens on this issue, which I'm super passionate about um, following a path of study in. Um, I wanted to probe a bit of a hypothetical. If there were a way for the um, West, the East-West relationship to become diplomatically and politically convenient, what would that way be? It's a very interesting, of course, there are always conversations going on away from the microphone and away from the cameras uh, to try and join up the world. And one thanks God for those, and as I sit on the edge of those. Uh, they, they've become difficult, in, not only between uh, uh, China and so-called the West, but between um, that, as I alluded to it at the very beginning of what I said, that new alliance of states which are hostile to the Western uh, uh, identities and cultures uh, of which Putin and China are two major contributors. Um, I would hope that there would come a day when uh, Western leaders and Chinese leaders could sit down opposite one another and have like an honest conversation about the, the values they share and the points at which they disagree. Um, at the moment, that is very difficult. There is such an embrace of uh, distinctiveness of difference, and there is such an embedding of political identity on both on both sides that it's very difficult to imagine a sensible conversation. Partly because leaders are expected to address human rights abuses when they, from the West, make trips to China and other countries. That's what they are forbidden and expected to do. If they don't, they fail the electorate. They fail their advisors and they fail the people who are being abused. By the same token, uh, from China's perspective, if she or the other leaders were in any sense appearing to be able to be leveraged, we might say, or manipulated or, accom or accommodate themselves to some Western agendas, they would potentially lose face, and this would not be the hard, formidable country they would like to continue to present themselves as. And so we are in a bit of an impasse, and not without hope, um, but it is, it's difficult to see it, but I would love to come to that point where we would actually have it. I was privileged to be in Beijing at a big shindig, big international shindig called the Beijing Forum, uh, when uh, uh, President uh, Bush Senior spoke, someone who'd continued his close links to the Chinese leadership over, uh, since the, leaving the White House. I think he'd been back there 18, 20 times. He spoke without notes to 2,000, 3,000 people in one of the great halls in the center of Beijing. And he spoke masterfully because they trusted him in Beijing. He was an insider. He did not compromise any of his excellent principles. But because they trusted him, because he had a relationship with them, he could have meaningful platform to say what you would want him to say all of you in that environment he said it on your behalf he said it on my behalf he said it on behalf of the west and you know the chinese heard him you mustn't forget that we've moved i think into a very bureau bureaucratized instrumentalized functional view of diplomacy classical patrician diplomacy of the kind that george senior embodied was relational he was talking to people he knew, he trusted, and who trusted him. Let's not lose that. And when I appeal to the affective dimension, part of the affective in inverted commas is about relationship. It's understanding humans, relating to humans as humans, not as Chinese. Um, and he, I must say it was a superb job. It's good to hear someone say, well done, that was really excellent. And he did it, um, but he, because he related to them, he knew them. Other questions? Please, sir. Um, so I wanted to ask a little bit more about the quarantine uh, aspect of it and uh, whether it's, it's fair to um, say that there's an equivalency on both sides of not listening. And from your experience, whether 
uh, members of the Chinese Communist Party do negotiate or um, act in diplomacy in good faith. And what comes to mind is the, the meeting in Alaska between our Secretary of State and the Chinese officials, where they were uh, rejecting any um, criticism of their own human rights issues and trying to make it seem like the United States had worse human rights issues than they did. So it seems like, at least within the Chinese Communist Party, there is not um, acting within good faith. Um, so I wanted to hear your thoughts on that when you're, when you're also saying that we need to recognize that these are just fellow humans who have shared values. I always feel maybe it's because of the work that I do. Um, I think when it comes to diplomacy, we need to remember the words of, of Jesus, you know, let, let him who is without sin cast the first stone. Few countries are pure. In fact, no country is pure. We are all susceptible to abuse, to lying, to imperialism, if we're large states. Guilty as charged. And when China pushes back, we sometimes have to say, they make a good point. What are we going to do about that? If we say we're, we're simply not guilty, there's no conversation. There is no hearing. Um, and I think we are in a, in, a, in, a, in a situation at the moment where there's a lot of stone throwing at glass houses in both directions. There is no real engagement. And that meeting illustrates precisely that. Um, having said which, I think human rights abuse in China at the moment is grotesque. Organ harvesting, the statistic associated with that in China, just make me boil with anger. I want to be sick when I hear about it. It's on an industrial scale. Uh, and that is frightful. Um, um, no person with any sort of moral compass cannot, I think, be moved by that and want to protest in some way. The question is, how do we make that point? And how do we do it in such a way that we are not saying, and we are innocent of all acts that do not, in some form or other, abuse humans. And the Chinese will point to the, the Me Too movement or you know, the abuse of a whole range of categories of individuals and say, are you really this great, pure uh, community that you would claim to me? Don't your own people indict you for your own failures and shortcomings? So that's, they know us well enough to be able to get the, the, the points under the skin or under the shell of our, our self-presentation to them. They do study us very carefully. And it's important we study them very carefully. And I suppose what the book is, is an appeal to do is to make sure you know your enemy really well. Um, so it's looking at Alaska from a different perspective. Okay, let's not position ourselves in an adversarial way, as I said at the very beginning. Let's begin from commonalities. And let's show that we know Chinese culture and also know the extent to which we've shaped it. And we won't let them deny that. That's, that's important, over, over 2,000 years, I think. Yes, please. Last question, and if I may, I've got about 10 minutes more, and then some more Q&A after that. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I just wanted to ask a little bit more about, I guess, these changes to religious freedom that you referred to, and maybe what incited those changes, um, what some of the effects of, well, obviously we, we've seen persecution, but you've also commented on the fact that some of the statistics and the situations that are presented in the West are not necessarily commensurate to, to what's taking place on the ground. Um, and I guess, consequently, how has your role changed? Presumably, you're no longer able to speak in the same way, theologically, openly in those spaces, or perhaps you still are. Maybe you could clarify a little bit on that. Thank, Thank you. you. What precipitated the change? It was a perfect storm of issues, not one. Um, uh, change in Chinese leadership uh, against the background of a profound fissure at the heart of the Chinese uh, leadership. And in Xi Jinping's appointment, which I think was uh, instrumentalized by the, by the military, they needed to a strong arm uh, a united center for Chinese governance. It happened just after the Olympics. I think that China was 
nose secondly was blooded by the fact that in the 2008 Olympics, the world didn't kowtow and worship its achievement in having this wonderful Olympic game. That actually hurt uh, the, um, them quite a lot. At the same time, China was engaged in not necessarily unfriendly monitoring of religious movements. And there were three independent surveys done of religious affiliation in China. Uh, the so-called Blue Book, which was you know, a publicly uh, distributed study of the statistics on, on Christianity in China, I think it spooked the leadership. They saw the structures they'd set up through the Religious Affairs Bureau failing to cope with the explosion of Christian identities across all sorts of, of uh, Christian groupings, uh, some public and official, some unregistered and uh, uncontrollable. And they realized that they'd lost control of that. Uh, and then there were the dissident uh, groups of Falun Gong and uh, uh, growth in radicalized Buddhism, which had, was drifting over from Myanmar, uh, that again was a cause of considerable concern to them. Uh, and of course, not long after we had the Arab Spring and they saw the power of social media, they saw capacities of communities to network one another. They began to be aware of, as we've seen played out in Xinjiang, that uh, a conscientizing of ethnic minorities, in that case, uh, the Uyghur Muslim communities and other minorities, this was all fracturing the artificial construct, which is China, like India. China is essentially an artificial construct with, with, with vast numbers of people from different ethnic groups, 50 plus ethnic minorities in China, uh, in addition to the Han majority, straining to be held together and not able to be held together, except with a pretty tough hand. I've always felt I wanted to say outside of China, you know, give them a break. You know, your China controls 1.3, 1.4 billion people. Central government cannot be a pushover to create any sort of coherence there. And if they are a bit tough, not surprisingly, but 2008, 2010, perfect storm and, and more factors in addition to that. They just began to say, we're gonna to have to begin to lock down again. Most of us assumed that the restrictions brought in prior to the 2008 Olympics, which is quite normal, before a big Chinese event, you know, party congress, lockdown, run up to the Olympics, lockdown. And most of us assumed, but for the growth of Christianity and the, and the pushing out of the boundaries, most of us assumed relaxation would return. It simply didn't and hasn't, and it's intensified really since then. And they love to choose an individual or, uh, the, the old Chinese expression is, you know, you, you, you kill the chicken to frighten the monkey. Uh, and you have a few exemplary cases. They are past masters at um, um, toxicifying a person. So everybody associated with this person becomes toxic. And they're brilliant at it. It's an incredible strategy for social control. That's what we've seen more and more. It's been, it's been painful for those of us who love China to see that reversion, the second cultural revolution. Yes, please. Please, please, please. Your name, please. Thank you, Professor Hancock. My name is Sun Kyu Han from South Korea, but I prefer to be called Peter. Jesus. So my current thesis, this is about the violent conflict in Kufu and Confucianism birthplace, and as also known as the Holy Land of Confucianism. But my question is not the one I have researched, but the one that I initially seek to answer, but uh, I'm but unable to answer, and I hope you can answer this question, which is the Chinese Christianity during the Maoist regime. So my question is, I have two, two questions. So one is, unlike the West, especially the Protestants, and considering their responses on their religious faith, during the Reformation era and 30 years war, why Chinese Christianity choose to follow or sacrifice during the Maoist atheist policy, which is the land reform, the great um, fort and the cultural revolution? Is it because, ver because of the virtue of Confucianism on which deeply embedded with Chinese and even Chinese Christianity or were they following the cross on which Jesus has shown? 
Also, my last question is seeing a similar situation today's Chinese religious landscape, a landscape under Xi Jinping. Do you think Chinese Christianity is following the virtue of Confucianism? Thank you. Uh, lots there. I'm going to have to be rather brief um, in reply. Just remember that for between about 1928, 1945, missionary communities were divided over communism. Uh, there was a deep recognition that communism was bringing to China egalitarianism. And quite a lot of the Western missionary uh, communities thanked God for that because they'd seen the regional oppression of local lords. They'd seen that China was not a place of personal freedom. Over time, the atheistic dimension within communism became clear and then almost uniformly, Christian leaders from outside began to say, China now represents a threat to uh, Christian identity. Um, um, in terms of whether the Christian community um, in China now is reflecting any sort of Confucian identity, I think this is all I would say is that Chinese Christians love their country. Uh, I've met dear friends who've been persecuted by the authorities who love their country. Because the default mechanism in China is not me, 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 as in the West, it's we, we, we. It's corporate identity. And insofar as Chinese Christians and Chinese Christianity uh, respond in a Confucian way to the present uh, situation, then it would be because they have owned that deep sense of corporate national identity. And they want to be loyal Chinese. And they grieve when Western Christians misrepresent their country. I've been in many conversations when, when they've said to me, but why does the West always criticize the country as Christians we love? And it can be very painful. We forget that. We forget that. Um, these are, these are good for them. But that sense of corporate identity, that's the one thing I would drop in. It's a big question. I just opted for two elements. May I just crave your indulgence a little more and talk about geopolitics and all of this? Can you bear it? Are you alive? Life signs from the, from the is that all right? If you say no, then you'll go <laughs> the end, of, like the end of Gladiator, off with his head. Are you all right? I look to all of you. I feel these are my inquisitors in the AGS Council. All right, carry on. Thank you very much. Professor Diva, he gives me the imperial thumbs up. Okay, bear with me. This really is much shorter, but I do just want to draw out some things. I'm going to link back a tiny bit, some new stuff for you, okay? Now, as I said, in this shorter second part, I want to reflect on the significance of the relationship between Christianity and Confucianism for contemporary geopolitics. But first, if I may, three points by way of introduction to these two great cultural traditions. General points, but I think they're important. First, the traditions that trace their roots to the Chinese bureaucrat and moral teacher, Confucius, or Confucius, as the early 20th century Jesuit missionaries China called him, and to the first century Palestinian preacher and miracle worker Jesus, these two great traditions are only as significant as interpreters choose to make them. That is, their value is not tangible or quantifiable like cash in the bank or a medical procedure, rather to those who honor them, their worth is of a more exalted kind. It lies, of course, devotees would say, in the priceless realm of wisdom, self-discovery of moral excellence, the saving power of timeless truth and sacrificial love. As hermeneutics remind us, if we are predisposed to reject those higher categories, then Confucius and Jesus have no significance for us at all. And they have no role to play in contemporary 
geopolitics. If, on the other hand, we are open to hear wisdom and truth in what, what they say, we may discover they still speak with transformative power into our complex postmodern world, point one. Second introductory point, appreciation of the significance of Confucianism and Christianity does not depend on faith or discipleship. Culture studies and linguistics, like history, philosophy, political theory, sociology, and anthropology, permit us to engage with these two great traditions as social phenomena, as functional instruments of societal formation. And this is important if we're to appreciate the impact of their relationship on contemporary geopolitics. We need to be able to objectify these two realities, Christianity and Confucianism, to observe and evaluate them objectively. Their power, their appeal, I would argue, lie in their capacity to address life at its highest intellectual, spiritual, and moral level, and, and, and in the raw business of everyday life where they barter and bargain for the right to shape the way we live. And in this, they are palpably more than mere ideas. They belong to the complex ritualization of human interaction and societal formation. As such, they're part of the web and waft of domestic politics and international diplomacy at their highest and at their deepest levels. Third introduction point. Christianity and Confucianism enshrine ideas, inverted commas, and they belong within the history of ideas, that discipline. When they are rightly evaluated according to their functional impact and their intellectual integrity, but rather they are rightly evaluated then according to their functional impact and their intellectual integrity. When we study them as the embodiment of ideas, three things stand out. First, their ideas address humanity in relationship, in relationship to heaven, Confucius is Tien, Jesus is God, in relationship to self, as the object of Confucius's moral pedagogy and Jesus's redemptive life and death, and in relation to others. For Confucius, those who inhabit the five key relationships of obligation, for Jesus, as I said a moment ago, any and every neighbor. Second, their ideas have demonstrated remarkable power over two millennia to capture the mind, the will, the motivation of hundreds and hundreds of millions of residents of this blue planet. They're, they are a reminder of the power of an idea as much as the impact of what I cited earlier of those paradigmatic figures like Socrates and Buddha, Gandhi and Mother Teresa as intentional purveyors of an idea or system of ideas, Jesus and Confucius and the traditions of Christianity and Confucianism that we trace to them can and should be compared not just to religious initiatives, but to other socio-political, intellectual, and philosophical traditions that have in other ways shaped our world through their ideas, such as Marxism and Maoism capitalism and democracy, royalty, militarism. In other words, to ask about the geopolitical impact of the relationship between Christianity and Confucianism is to do something that fits their global profile. Third, as worthy contributors to the history of ideas, Confucianism and Christianity are rightly located and evaluated as the father of historicism and Church would argue, within an historical continuum of cause and effect. They're not something outside of them. As such, claims to their uniqueness are moderated by their historical antecedents and successors. Now, though to some devotees, this threatens their standing to others, it admits greater awareness of their global profile, and indeed of the interconnectedness of human and wisdom and culture that 
these traditions reflect. Furthermore, it allows us to recognize that neither Christianity nor what we know in the West as Confucianism are static phenomena. Their ideas have spread like viruses. They have also mutated over time with one key difference, except in its most progressive deconstructed forms, Christianity remains bound to Jesus in ways that Confucianism is not to its master confucer. Now, second part, the geopolitical significance of the relationship between Confucianism and Christianity. So for the remainder, I just want to suggest five ways in which the relationship between Confucianism and Christianity is of material relevance to contemporary geopolitics. If you want to see the working in the margins which support my conclusions, then please uh, invest or rather save up uh, to buy the book. Which, as the strap line suggests, is as much about East West relations as about the minutiae of comparative philosophy and theology. Firstly, and I'm going to just give you the bullet points the relationship between Christianity and Confucianism is historically foundational for contemporary geopolitics. These two great traditions are the seedbed out of which the West, out of which the East has grown. And we recognize, if we are willing to admit it, the extent to which that historical foundational quality is a reality. I really am going to just summarize these points. Second, both Christianity and Confucianism are materially relevant to contemporary geopolitics because both systems of thought are morally rigorous. That is, jointly and severally, they articulate ethical values in and for the global polis. And allegiance to them is not required to recognize this. It's part of the objective phenomenological given that they share. Now, as history illustrates, the impact of this, this has had on geopolitical praxis varies. At times, Judeo-Christian just war theory or a biblical demonizing of enemies has fired Western patriotism. At other times, Confucian situational ethics has justified diplomatic duplicity, getting at your point, or we categorized aliens in different ways as so-called foreign devils. But more positively, Christianity and Confucianists have both created and preserved a moral compass for the societies and leaders they serve. And there's notable harmony, as I said, in what they have articulated. Third, the relationship between Christianity and Confucianism impacts contemporary geopolitics because they are both, as the last point might suggest, culturally disruptive. Moral questions, as I know well, tend to discomfort me, and they tend to discomfort all of us. The biographies of Jesus and Confucius suggest that they were both subversive characters, disruptive in what they said and did. And both represent an appeal to submit one's life, one's society to a higher process of accountability. Fourth, Confucianism and Christianity confront your contemporary geopolitics with the weight of their conceptual coherence. One of the reasons I think why they're so irritating for some is that they lay almost a uh, hegemonic claim to all of life, to a meta narrative. In that sense, they're countercultural to postmodern fragmentation. Textualist in form, narrative in style, they both propound an archetypal myth reinforced by a tightly regulated ritual system. The key to the frustration of Maoist China, Marxist Russia, Myriad forms of subjectivized atheism and cynical secularism lies, I believe, here. That is, in the power of the societal myth that Christianity and Confucianism have articulated and its conceptual coherence, its comprehensive claims. Fifth, the last, the relation between Christianity and Confucianism is materially relevant to geopolitics because both are systemically significant. They address issues that are central to international conflict, diplomatic debate. Both articulate a philosophy of nature, 
a view of human identity, both inculcate respect for the environment and social harmony, both decry the abuse of power, the destruction of the weak, both see education as the heart of ethics and the cultivation of character, both interpret health holistically and name the disempowering effects of mental strife. In short, if contemporary geopolitics is open to the light of ancient wisdom on dark modern problems, classical Confucianism and historic Christianity offer us much. However, as we saw earlier, hermeneutics alerts us to the importance and danger of perspective. Simply put, and with this I end, there is nothing for us in Confucianism and Christianity if we don't think there is. I suggest there is much if we believe there may be. Or surely, as they sometimes say, any port in a geopolitical storm. Questions, friends, just for the last five minutes. Yes, please. you yes. you sort of have to make the decision to, to think that we're more similar than we are different i've noticed over time i think again a sort of frightening thing that you have where it's like more and more chinese people that i know seem to be in, engaging with and in, in internalizing the narrative that they're different that there's something perhaps superior going on and i and i, and I notice this sometimes in, in you know classes or things like that and it kind of scares me and it's really hard to connect with those people when it's like you say something and it's either taken as a criticism or it must be false and there's like a sort of a wall there. And, and you know, you could think too, it, with the internet, there's a huge, there's a great firewall. There's a lot of processing that goes on and, and a whole generation of people I feel in China yes. are being inculcated in this narrative. And yes. I wonder personally, how do you break through that? Um, my, my sense is that an awful lot of Chinese behavior mirrors ours and they're giving back to us what we've given to them. They've seen us in that way. And they say, why shouldn't we be like that? And to a British person, you know, I'm acutely aware of our imperial colonial past, and we've had to unlearn that. And when people remind us of how censorious and opinionated and arrogant the British can be, we have to say, yeah. And when they do that back to us from India or from other parts of the, of the, of the former British Empire, you have to say, they're only giving as good as we gave them. And there's a lot of that. And we just have to, as they say, suck it up. Thank you. Please. You began by illustrating the influence of Western thought in China through the, you bumped into all sorts of translations of all sorts of foundational things, just kind of tying that back with the question of how China is changing. Do you expect your book to be translated into Chinese? Um, Fortunately, my, my Chinese uh, colleagues and uh, contributors, in the sense that they, they helped me with it, I think they would love that to be the case. Um, I asked whether you I, expect it. Uh, I, I quietly do. I quietly do. Um, because contrary to the to popular representational reporting, at the highest level, China is driven by ideas, good ideas. It's why the academy, inverted commas, has such a profile there. And if they encounter something that's worth considering, they will consider it. And you've just got to give them something that's worth reading. That's the issue. I hope my, my Chinese friends seem very enthusiastic about it. Really, it's for them to say. Um, I've never great, I'm no great lover of the limelight and you know, being published, but if they choose to do that, that's fine. Um, please. You spoke a bit earlier about how over 2,000 years, um, the West and China interacted in exchange through trade and literature and many other forms of shared human experience and how they mutually formed each other. And I accept that premise. Um, but what's interesting is that that formation takes place when something is shared. And I wanna push back a little bit on your response to the earlier question, which is, um, if, if two sides are looking at the same set of facts and seeing it each from their own narrow perspective, I'm gonna not aim the mic at that speaker, um, 
they see it from their own narrow perspective, it's it's squabbling of the kind that you're saying, maybe it's not fair to, to say that one side is doing something different from another. My concern, I guess, though, is when um, the two sides don't necessarily use the same facts. Um, and, and I'm thinking in this particular instance about some of the propaganda that's taking place in the Russia Ukraine scenario, where uh, one side can observe certain activities and then the other side can just say, um, no, actually, that's not what happened. Those are planted bodies. And um, by controlling the entire media sphere, um, they're not sharing the same set of truths. So I'm wondering if, in general, human societies differ and argue, but it works when they're sharing literature and trade and culture and uh, movies and things like that, they're seeing each other. But with the Chinese firewall, with Russian media control, does that optimism break down? Wonderful question. We could talk about it probably for quite a long time. I, um, um, I think we must be questioning the effectiveness of the firewall. Part of the reason for the like, clampdown was the extent to which China's youth had been globalized um, through the internet, through friendships, through travel, through education. Um, and insofar as they can, I think that they continually punch through that firewall to relate to the rest of the world. Um, my, my only counter to that is to say, don't underestimate Chinese patriotism. They may have punched through, but they still love their country. And in a way, we don't want them not to love their country. Patriotism is a good right thing when it's handled in the right, in the right way. And how we shape one another is a very complex business. It's not always uh, articulate. It's not always conscious. Uh, we will have picked up things, and partly my book is a, is a commentary on this, we will have picked up things unknowingly. Blue and white China, willow pattern that is everywhere in the traditional British home. You know, it, it's, it's traceable to China. Um, and myriad other expressions of that. We, we're not always, we don't always engage with cultures in a conscious way, nor do we always consciously reject other cultures, but subconsciously we are. Perhaps picking up the last question, we don't like being told that we are no longer number one, that there is another superpower, or as a British person, we're, we're post-imperial, and you know, it's hard luck, you know, you've had your day in the sun. We don't like to hear that. We want to go on believing perhaps that we're still a great power. Um, and of course, that's nonsense. Um, so the act of the conscious and the unconscious has to be factored into the way cultures and individuals relate to one another. That's all I would want to just, just, just put that in and then process the data a little more. Uh, how, having said which, I suppose we've seen this with Putin over Ukraine, and we know it well in a lot of Western political circles. We, have, there is a manipulation of, of the truth. We're back to Solzhenitsyn's great lie, and uh, in different ways spin in the UK has been um, used and abused to try and make sure the message is the message number 10 wants the world to hear. It it's, uh, horrifies us sometimes the way that uh, veracity is compromised for sake of political convenience or the electorate. Um, Putin is perhaps doing in a more extreme form what we permit people to do in a arguably slightly less extreme form, at least in a way we're more used to in, in our Western political systems, uh, which is to distort. Um, I don't mind sometimes having different views of the same data. It, it gives pause to say, have I seen it right? Don't I need the other person to remind me? And any person who reads the New Testament knows there are four gospels. Uh, any court of law will say you're likely to have four different viewpoints of an incident because people see things differently. Uh, what I've tried in the way that the book is to conscientize ourselves to perspective. In that sense, it is an exercise in hermeneutics, self-awareness in the way we interpret reality. Last question, please. 
Please, please, please. I must say I'm impressed by your intellectual energy, all of you. You know, yeah. You're pretty good. Duke clearly puts you through your intellectual paces. You're all fit and healthy. Fantastic. Thank you, Professor. Um, I just wanted to go back to what you said about uh, Confucianism and Christianity both being, you know, disruptive, um, you know, sets of ideas. But we've also point you've also pointed out correctly that they have shaped the way in which our societies operate today. So. What space do those ideas have to reshape the, our geopolitical understandings when they already shaped them for millennia in a way? Can they bring new life to something they've created themselves? Super question, super question. I think what I wanted to say is when you get into the weeds of these traditions, there is something that challenges, in that sense, it's disruptive. Disruptive for an individual, Am I living responsibly, disruptive of society? Is the society run in a, in a way that is respectful of, of, of every member of the community? But maybe that, that disruption has been institutionalized, and that's why one can also say they've brought into these systems justice. They've brought into this system a sense of accountability. They've brought into this, this system through disruption a sense of the rule of law, what is appropriate, what is not appropriate. And that sort of disruption, we want to say, is wholesome. Give us more of it. I think what's sad is when certainly Christianity gets very muted and watered down and is accommod accommodated itself to culture, and also perhaps when China forgets that within its ancient identity, it has remarkable resources. Now, there is an awareness of that in the Chinese elite and the leadership. Um, and there have been times over the last... 20 years when China has re-embraced its Confucian identity. Just at the moment, it's gone back into a Marxistic, uh, totalitarian frame of reference and to its own impoverishment, is what I would want to say. Thank you. I really must stop. Thank you all so much. like to say thank you to Professor Hancock and again to our hosting uh, co-sponsoring organizations and everyone who made this night happen. I do want to put in a, a very brief plug for uh, events coming up later this week. Uh, AGS uh, tomorrow evening is hosting a Zoom conversation with Kevin Rudd, former Prime Minister of Australia, um, about, uh, about a recent book uh, conversation. Uh, so that will be tomorrow at 5.30 on Zoom. Um, I'd also like to mention uh, the Thomistic Institute on Thursday uh, will be hosting a lecture on economic justice and the common good uh, with Mary Hirschfeld, a Villanova professor. That's also at 5.30 and um, you'd be welcome to join. Let's uh, give one more round of applause and thanks. <laughs>